Hi everybody, happy Thursday. Today is Tornado Part Two, and I have with me Rashid, who today is putting on his detective outfit to be a storm detective. We ended yesterday with a few questions, actually I think just two. They had to do with these maps. We wanted to know why does only the eastern part of the United States get tornadoes, which you can see in both these maps? And why is it that the United States gets more tornadoes than anywhere else in the world? There are two parts to this answer. And the answer for both those questions is kind of the same. The first part of the answer is air masses. Do you remember from yesterday, those are big, big, big bunches of air that run into each other. Warm air, cool air. But besides just being warm and cool, sometimes it's important for the air to be moist, which means wet. If you look at these two maps, let's stick with this one. Do you notice that down here by Florida, this is water. This is called the Gulf of Mexico. This is almost like a bathtub. It's hemmed in on this side by Florida and by this side and on this side by Texas and Central America and the water gets really warm. That warm, moist air mass that comes off of the Gulf of Mexico is a key ingredient for tornadoes. Nowhere else in the world does this exact setup of warm air, cool air from Canada, and even a burst of dry warm air from the Southwest come together to make tornadoes. That is why this area has so many, this area especially. So there's one other thing we need to think about. Let's look again closely. Do you see all these little bumps? What are they? Mountains, yes. Tornadoes are only tornadoes if they can touch down. Did you know that? If they don't touch the ground, they're not actually called a tornado. They're only called a funnel or a funnel cloud. So even if all of those air masses somehow collided and gave us the right conditions for a tornado out here in the West. Look at all the mountains. The ground is not flat in a lot of the Western United States. It's very hard for tornadoes to not only form because of the air masses, but then also touch down and stay on the ground. So the biggest group of mountains in the whole United States is right here. It serves like a wall for tornadoes. Tornadoes get going all the time right here in tornado season, but they can't cross this big area of the Rocky Mountains, which goes all the way up into Canada. Tornadoes can never do very well where it's bumpy and hilly and mountainy. Look over here. Here's another area where there aren't many tornadoes because this is where the Appalachian Mountains are. And then up here, you have the Berkshires and other mountains. That's why in these parts of the east, there are also not many tornadoes. Also way up here, those air masses are not running into each other in the same way because they're further away from the Gulf of Mexico. So I hope that helps you understand these maps and the answers to our two questions. Rashid, does that help you understand? Mm -hmm. Another really neat thing about storms is that there are actual people who do not wear detective outfits, but who travel around tracking and hunting and looking closely at storms. These are called storm chasers or storm hunters, and maybe they even might be called a tornado chaser or a tornado hunter. Now, I've never met a storm chaser myself, but Margaret was able to interview her grandfather, her grandpa Lansdale. He was a hurricane hunter for part of his career. Margaret was able to interview him 
and wrote an amazing report about what she learned. It's right here. I don't have the best printer, but you can see she wrote pages and pages. I want to read it to you because it's kind of like a mini history reporter thing that can help us understand storms a little bit better. Now, again, this is about hurricanes, but the same types of people use the same types of instruments to learn more about tornadoes. Here's what Margaret shared about her Grandpa Lansdale. Grandpa Lansdale was a hurricane hunter. He dropped instruments into the hurricane. Wow, do you get that? He dropped instruments into the hurricane that measured the hurricane. He dropped them with parachutes and he did not get them back. They got radio to get information from the instruments. So they drop instruments into the hurricane and the instruments would gather all kinds of data and information and send it to the radio instruments that the people in the plane were using. They got radio to get information from the instruments. He was the pilot. There was seven people on the plane. When he went through the hurricane wall, remember the eye wall we talked about? It was bumpy. When he was in the eye, it was like there was no hurricane. The eye lasted only 10 minutes. So he'd gone through all of this, um, the bands, the layers we talked about, and then he meets the wall where it's super bumpy because that's where the wind is the highest. And then 10 minutes in quiet calm, that was the eye. In a hurricane, it is better to be on a plane than on the ground. Hurricanes are really loud. He did not crash a plane in a hurricane. So thankful that he stayed safe. What a job. Well, very, very similar. There are people, detectives, who go very close to tornadoes. It's very dangerous. People have even died doing these, these jobs. But the information that they're able to collect has helped us learn so much about tornadoes. Now it's time for us to build our own. And I have a special helper here today. Come on over, Alden. I want you to see how we do this so that if you have the materials, you can also do this yourself at home. All right. <laughs> so here's what you need. Can you hold up what they need? First, you need two of these bottles. And you need something to connect them. First, I thought this wasn't working, but at the top of each bottle, when you first take the cap off, guys, there's a little white ring. You need to take it off. Mom or dad can use a little knife or something to get under there. Just make sure you take that off because this won't fit without it. You can also use electrical tape or duct tape to connect your bottles. This works really well. Those work okay too. So if you want to use one of these, I think I told you guys, I have a whole bunch of them at school. You can go help yourself. All right, what else do we need, Alma? Um, You can add food coloring or glitter. We have a couple colors of glitter here. You might have different ones. We have green, a little bit of blue, and we have some silver glitter. And then you might even want to put things in your tornado. So there are these little tiny foam balls that sometimes are in putty or slime. Those work really, really well in these. We don't have any, though. Yes, we do. We do? Yeah. Well, I don't know if we can go get them right now. Here we go with a little guy who's going to go in our tornado. I even found a little cat. So the key is you just have to find things that can fit through the top. So mm -hmm. he can if you put his arms up. So, Alden, will you fill one of these bottles just slightly past halfway, please? Or put them in first. Okay. We have our guy and our cat in our bottle. Okay, fill her up. Does it matter if it's hot or cold? So she's filling it up. Nope. Alden asked a great question. She asked if it matters if it's hot or cold. It really doesn't because... Once it's been in your bottle for a while, it's going to be the same temperature as the rest of the room anyway. Just notice, guys, I still have that dot. 
It's so annoying. But it's inside the computer. I can't do anything about it. Okay, we got it. Okay, come on over here closer. Here's our guy. And the cat. Where's the cat? I don't know. Oh, the cat's at the bottom. <laughs> the cat is not floating. Oh, the cat it's is, not good. The cat died. Okay, now that we have our water in our bottle, let's put in one drop of food coloring and see what happens. The cat died. Just one drop. Actually, if the cat died, then it would be floating. Okay, and then we're going to jiggle it up a little bit. Oh, Ooh, that's plenty. Look, one drop. That's all we needed. And you don't have to use food coloring. We're technically making a water spout, which um, is a tornado that forms out over the ocean. And it is actually a funnel of water. But the cool thing about this is the motion is the same. So I still call them bottle tornadoes because it still shows you the same motion and formation of a tornado or a twister. Yes. Okay. Glitter happening now. Alden's putting in some, um, she's putting in a little bit of silver glitter. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> okay, we've got silver. Do you want to do anything else? You could do just silver. You could finish this blue. Okay. There's hardly any left. Let's dump it in there. Awesome. Okay, so we've got glitter kind of floating on the top. No worries about that. We've got our guy floating on the top in a sea of glitter. And we've got our cat down <laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, that's everything we're going to put in our tornado. So let's attach this. Again, as I learned this morning, it will not fit if the little plastic ring is still on there. Okay. <laughs> now don't forget guys um don't turn it upside down to attach the second bottle oh i think i'll just turn it upside down and screw it in oh not be good don't do it you die your counter <laughs> yeah your counter would not be happy okay are we good you want to test both sides make sure they're both really really tight oh we are good to go here all right, now, we've got our tornado in a bottle. It's important to get the right motion down. So take your hand like this, you do it too, come here, and practice going like this in a circle, okay? You're gonna do that with the top. You can practice it here with your bottle before you even turn it over. You're going in a circle like this, okay? Now, we're gonna flip. Here we go. You're gonna flip it like this. Oh, the I have the label pointing the wrong way. Until you see the spinning motion, and you're gonna see it trying to reach down. But the man is <laughs> no, the man is preventing it. <laughs> oh, there we go. Can you guys see it? He's spinning around in the tornado. You can see the water spout reaching down, and if you lose it a little bit. You can get it going again. Is my cat blocking it? Guys, I think the cat's blocking it. I think we need to take oh, it out. the cat's blocking it. The cat needs to come out. I think that the cat's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get the cat out of there. But I don't know how to do that without emptying it. So the cat was a bad choice. Lesson, Lego men float and work really well. Lego cats, nope. <laughs> Don't do it. Because look. Shake stuck. it. Get, get all. Okay, the there we go. Ooh, look. Can you guys see? That's a beautiful <laughs> one. The cat. The cat. The cat got stuck in it. Oh, my word. Look at that. And you can even see from the top, you can see the spout. Wow. Okay. Guys, it, these are so fun. And You're going to have so much fun with these. I'm going to send all of them to the other side of the sink to somehow get Where's, the cat out. Where is the cat? Well, the cat. The cat. It's not even we can't there. find the cat. The cat's in the bottom of here now. So oh. you, you, you go figure that out. Thank you. <laughs>
And while Alden figures that out, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the math you're doing today. And then I hope you guys have a great time um, building your tornadoes today or learning more about them. I sent you, um, it's a book you can read aloud, read along with, and it's Got so much information about tornadoes, which is really cool. Um, anyway, here we go. <laughs> that cat. I don't know what we're going to do about the cat. So guys, today we're just going to do some more subtraction practice. We're not having to spend so much time on this um, like we did with addition because you guys have become such amazing professionals with tens and ones. So... Today we're just going to take, Alden got the cat out, it's good. Today we're going to take problems that look sideways and all you're going to do is take them and line them up in their columns of tens and ones, tens and ones, just like we did with addition uh, last week, right? So how could we fit this problem into this, into these squares? Let's do it real quick. Ready? 29 is two tens and nine ones. Take away or minus two tens and six ones. Can I solve pretty easily now? Rules are the same, guys. Start with the ones. Nine ones minus six ones is three ones. And I could do that no problem, so I don't need to regroup. Tomorrow, I'm gonna show you what happens if you need to regroup with subtraction. But today, we're not doing that yet. Subtract your ones, then subtract your tens. What's two take away two? Zero. I can write the zero or I can leave it blank. The answer of 29 minus 26 is three. That was so easy. So your practice sheet looks just like that, okay? There's two sheets. The second one is also similar to this, but with a little harder problems. The key is, be a robot, do it the same way every time, just like we did with addition. You're gonna need to be an even smarter robot once we start regrouping with subtraction. But first, be a robot with those tens and ones, okay? Subtract the, ten, the ones first and then the tens. Ones first and then the tens. Be a robot. Do the same thing every time, all right? Okay, my little robots and tornado chasers. I think Alden got the tornado running again. Bring it over here. Here we go. We've got our guy in there now. The cat is safe. Look at that funnel. The cat was really good. And the guy's spinning like crazy. The cat was no good. So... Enjoy. Have a great day, guys. Say bye, Alt. Bye. <laughs> See you guys later. Whoa.